Hello and welcome to GA Embedded, our GA service here on Balls.ie, where we bring you the most in-depth analysis of the hurling and football championships. Now, every Monday we are here live on Monday morning to uh, look back on the best of the weekend's action. Um, it's all hurling this weekend. We'll catch up with Darren O'Sullivan next week. There's lots of football to talk about, but um, we'll have all football next week, but it's hurling this week. What a week it's been. We'll talk to Tipperary legend Shane McGrath in just a couple of minutes. Later on the show then as well, we'll have um, Morris Brosnan for the first in a series of his GA Embedded article went out last week where he talked about hand signals of Gaelic football. We'll get in depth with him on that and talk a little bit about the football games from the weekend as well. We'll, you know, we have to keep things, the, the really important uh, issues are discussed on this show. So we'll be talking about GA haircuts, of course, because uh, again, these are the important things. And of course, we'll guess the handicaps later on. Gary and PJ are standing by. Gary looking to retain his title as we go into the football weekend next week. But what a weekend of hurling. It's time to talk about a four incredible matches, shocks, controversy, a little bit of controversy, and uh, um, great skill, extra time, the whole shebang. Let's talk about it right now with Shane McGrath. Shane, how are you doing? That was, uh, are you, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm quite recovered from it. We talked last week about uh, four, four games and the championship really kicking off and us suddenly being into a place where we knew who the provincial finals are, but all four games had their own story in a way and all of them lived up to hype in their own way yeah that was it yeah it was it was, it was going to be a feast or a famine and we we, we expected we get a feast and we did in between one thing or another as you said there was lots of controversy and you know i suppose it, it is a little bit of a pity maybe that the controversy is probably taken over from a lot of the good hurling that that went on as well so look lots to talk about four games four very different games as well mike i think you know you had yeah I suppose me and you, me and you were chatting over the weekend as well, and we said, you know, the art of defending. While a lot of people were saying it's gone, it was very much to the forefront in, I suppose, maybe three of the games at the weekend, anyway, um, definitely in two of them, anyway. So that was great to see, and some individual displays, outstanding individual displays in defending types, and you know, maybe we haven't seen a defender get harder the year in some time, but maybe this will be the year that that uh, that that could happen, and. I mm. suppose one guy, one guy, in, well, two guys in particular. I suppose two cornerbacks. They've, they're, they're, they've been referred to as the creme de la creme of cornerbacks. Bar Carl Barrett yesterday did a great job. Tony Kelly and I thought uh, Sean Finn was outstanding against Cork as well. And I thought Sean O'Donoghue who was outstanding. But look, we'll we'll probably talk about it more. But look, a great weekend of hurling. Uh, you won't keep everyone happy, Mike. I'm sure some people were happy with the low score and some people were not happy with the higher score. Bit of banter on Twitter there. People were saying in the Dublin Galway game, what are we going to do? There's no, there's no scoring anymore in hurling. We'll have to make the slitter heavier. So look, that's, that's <laughs> lighter, yeah. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, I mean, that's and that was probably the story of the week in a way was Dublin's win over Galway and how much you need that. And we'll get to that. But let's actually just get the controversy out of the way then early, right? Because it's, look, I mean, as a, you know, as a tip man, you probably said, like, what's the big deal? There's decisions of the course of a game. Maybe. Uh, I've seen some pe tip people saying that. Well, nobody necessarily agreed with us. There's a... Uh, James Owens given the referee as a clear man I'm apoplectic about it but then I suppose the day after is the time to kind of reflect with a cooler head and say like what you might have heard this like there was discussions all the way through um I suppose the spring or even the early summer in this case about what this rule before the league even came back about what was going to what was going to happen in this rule and I actually heard the hypothetical of what if a guy is dragged down on the sideline is that a penalty is that a yellow card and does it put an impossible does it put referees in an impossible position where they have to be judge jury and executioner in a very very quick manner as to what it defines a goal chance and you know Brian Lowen wouldn't excuse James Owens for that and I, I completely see where he's coming from but it also just puts a needless pressure on a referee doesn't it like outside of whether he was right wrong or indifferent yeah, I suppose I, I look at it two ways, Mike, right? I, I look at it a hurling fan first and foremost, and I can look at it maybe from the officials or the referees' point of view, secondly. So from a hurling fan, fan's point of view, right? So I was there as a tip fan yesterday. If I was to roll reverse, and if, um, let's say, Dan McCormack, who was lined out to play wing forward for us, had taken down David Reedy in the same manner, uh, in the same position, and Claire got a penalty, and Dan McCormack got the line for us, I would be absolutely furious. Mm. And... I think most hurling people, even a lot of tip people at the match yesterday, you know, I was in the stand there yesterday and all the tip crowd around me, we thought, right, free here for J.O. We, uh, we were, it was uh, 113, uh, sorry, what, I think the score at the time, we were down, we were down two points at the time. Two, we thought, yeah. Look, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, bring, we'll bring it back to a point here. J.O. will get the free, difficult free now, very, very tight angle. Like, I'll be honest, everybody in the Gaelic grounds yesterday, Claire and tip fans, 
were couldn't believe that Jason Ford was lining up to take the penalty. And I'd say mm. I'd say the tip players couldn't either. So like from 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 a fan's point of view, you know, we, we a lot of people just couldn't believe the decision. Um, it, it was a foul. Uh, probably was a yellow card. So you know, from that point of view, like from a hurling point of view as well, this clear goal scoring thing, and I'll talk about it in a second about what Fergal Horgan said earlier in the year, and he probably came across Mike as probably the top referee in the country over the weekend because of the way he ref the game. But a lot of people don't know Fergal Horgan would have played the game at a very, very high level, you know, with underage teams with tip and being involved, you know, with, with tip the whole way up along and has proven himself to be a top referee. Like, it, if, if, if Jake Morris... He's, I think he's 32, 33 metres. There, there was a tweet going around there that he was actually closer to the Ennis Road than he was mm. to the goalposts. And even if he gets the ball in his hand, that's his first catch. So he's 32 metres. He's going to solo on, solo on. There's two or three clear defenders coming back in the picture. They'll definitely be back. And, and obviously the goalie there as well. By the time he puts the ball, gets his second catch, he still probably he still could be potentially 25, 26 metres from the goal. So... Is that a clear goal scoring opportunity? I don't know. Now, if I if I could just make if I could just say what the sin bin is, right? The sin bin is it punishes a trip, a pull down, or a careless use to hurley on an attacking player with a goal scoring opportunity inside the twenty meter line or the semi circle or the D as we call it. That's fair enough. The areas for consideration are where the foul occurred, how many defenders between the attacker and the goal, could another defender make a tackle, and how many players are in the area in front of the goal. Now, what Forgel Horgan said earlier in the year was. If it's a clear and obvious goal scoring chance, that's not the rule. If it's a goal scoring opportunity, it's it's not clear. And it's only the referee on the day that can call whether it's a sin bin or a penalty or not. It's completely up to him. So basically, what this comes down to, Mike, is it's the matter of opinion of the mm -hmm. referee on the day. Like yeah. the ruling is there, but it does come down to the matter of opinion on the referee on the day. And I think we could be here to the cows go home and talk about it. James Owen's opinion yesterday was that Jake Morris was 32 metres from the goals with not a defender clearly in sight and that that was a clear goal scoring opportunity. And I think for 99%, 99.9% of everyone else, it was not a clear goal scoring opportunity. And I suppose that's where the frustration comes from everyone. Like The one question I'd have about James, and I don't, I look, I say that even on Twitter last night, we don't need to be, you know, James Hall doesn't need to be hung, drawn and quartered about a decision made in, the, in in a game. But it's it's easy to say he shouldn't be punished for a mistake either. Whereas I haven't heard anybody suggest that this was a mistake from an official channel or from James Owens himself. Not that he necessarily needs to be answerable. But, you know, should a referee have a different opinion than 99.9% .9 of hurling fans? You know what I mean? We can get into, you know, them understanding the rules better and so on and so forth. But... You know, that suggests to me a massive problem. And that suggests to me, like, you know, is James Owens accountable for a decision like that? Should, in your opinion, I know we can be very harsh on referees sometimes, but it, it felt like even just watching last night in the Sunday game, it almost went the other way. It's like as if to say we can't say anything about a referee making a really yeah. poor decision here. Whereas, like, these things can be analysed, you know? Oh, yeah, I agree. Look, I think there's no one perfect. Um, we all make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes in life. We, we make them every day of our life. And the people not making mistakes aren't making progress. But I'm saying, like, if, if, if a player makes a big mistake, um, he probably won't start the next step, you know. Yes. So if a, if, a, if a referee makes a big call like this, I'm not saying it's a punishment, but, you know, do the referees committee come together and say, look, we maybe were considering it for a semi-final, and maybe we feel because of this decision... You know, you maybe you, you you might be in line to get to semi final. Now, you know, I'm sure the, ref, the referees are going to meet this week. They're going to look at it, and James Owens will say maybe technically he was right, but I suppose technically, you know, it's it's it just it just didn't make sense to to I think everybody else in in, in the broader community. We've seen the frustration with a lot of people, you know, and um, uh, both the clear people and I suppose a lot of neutrals. Mm. Like it's it's and in fairness, Brian Lowen, it's not Tipperary's fault, you know, and yeah. it's not Tipperary players' fault. They took full advantage of it. Ed McCarthy. He's a very physical, very fit guy, covers a lot of ground. And in the time he's off the field, it's been well documented, tip score 2-4 to 2 points for Clare. And that's and, and, and that's the change in the game. But that's not Tipperary's fault. And fair play to Tipperary for taking advantage of it. Every other top team in the country would do the exact same thing while the guy is off the pitch. So, you know, I think that while, while we're all human, um, and, and I'm not saying there should be a punishment in this because it's not his job. It's not He's, he's not a professional referee like a Premier League player. But I'm sure the referees have to say, look, for the for the really really big games, maybe you're not at the you're not at the top of the picking order, maybe like you were before. And you know the Fergal Horgans of this world who would have seen this and would have maybe just gave the free and the yellow card. So look, I think I do think while rules are there to, to help us with the game and everything, Mike, I I I feel that common sense sometimes has to come into it. And the other side of it is, 
you know, James Owens, he's a, he's a former Ireland final referee, I think 2015. Mm. Like he would he would be able to consult with seven or eight officials in Crow Park. I, I think maybe if you looked back in it, and look, we've all had regrets in our careers, maybe he should have maybe done a little bit more consultation. I'm not saying bring in VAR, don't bring in VAR into Hurland, but I'm just saying more consultation, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They're all yeah. they're all they're all hooked up to each other. So. Yeah, and look, that's all, it's all fair enough. And and I want to move on to 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 tip and everything like that. But just as a as a as a player, as a viewer, as an analyst now, everything you know that you're involved in the game, um like I remember, I remember, like you were talking about, like sometimes you look at it almost from a neutral perspective, even when you're a fan. I remember the All Ireland semi final in 2013, and Patrick Donnellan rugby tackle. I think Graham will cut you to the ground for when Clare were like five, six points up, and it was a point. And I remember thinking to myself, as much as I'm happy about like Clare winning here, I think something needs to be done about this. There was a rule that needed to come in, but they just went in this. They just made it vague. They made it complicated, and. There was never a need for it. And it's it's a rule that, as I said, that's 2013 I'm talking about. We're a rule that's 10 years in the making here. And they just got it so wrong. So outside of even James Owens and you kind of reading out the rule there, it sounds all right. But when it's predicted that something like this would happen, <laughs> you know, it just seems to me yeah. it's like the GEA have a lot to answer for, I think, as well in something like this. And again, we're after spending 10 minutes talking about it at the, at, at the start of an unbelievable weekend hurl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, look at it. Look, it is. Look, it's the main talking point. You know, very, very little talk about who actually won the matches and, you know, the teams that actually lost. The teams that actually lost this weekend, I was just looking at it there now in, in time wise, right? They're going to have to win, uh, I think it is five games in 35 days trying to become an Ireland champions now for the yeah. teams that lost at the weekend. And I tell you, it's very hard going. They have to win three games, 21 days just to get back into an Ireland quarter final. Yeah. Um, so, look, that's, that, that's tough going for the losers. But look, I, I, I don't feel there's anything maybe too wrong with the rule. I just feel maybe okay. the interpretation of the rule, Mike, could be better. And I, and I really hope the refs sit down and have a really good chat about it at their meeting this week to say, look, uh, it wasn't the right call. Let's learn from this. And please, God, let's never, let's never let it happen again uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the rest of the championship. Anyway. Yeah, there's common sense in sport, I think, a lot of the time for any fans, even if you're not an expert and you know that something like that resulting in a, a more or less guaranteed goal plus a sin bidding is too much for that particular foul. But I will say that the two four to two points thing is 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 interesting in a way that I think Tip haven't got enough credit for. Because Limerick, when Peter Casey was sin binned, um, Limerick, I think, won that 10 minutes, like 4-2 or something like that, low scoring, and the, you know they did it right. Claire, you could have an argument didn't keep their heads they were fairly wrong then and, and and maybe didn't adapt well enough and that's going to be an experience thing for them and brian long going down the line but tip did and i thought one of, i thought that was emblematic of an entire performance yesterday over 70 minutes where i thought like the old dogs rose to the occasion you know you mentioned cottle barrett earlier on you saw it like potty mar very much struggling at the start of the game grew into the game brendan mar mm. jamie callan didn't get a touch i think for 20 minutes and ended up just playing this what I would consider like this is sort of like this playing full forward with his brain rather than his brawn for the like yeah. for the entire game. Some of the passes he did, some of the flicks, everything like that. And it was just it was those guys that kind of won the game for tip in the end, even though like it was a fifty or well twenty man performance, I suppose. Yeah, I tell you, you know, we talk about the experience that they had in the field, and I, I said it there last week. I felt the experience would, would stand to them, and it really, really did. Like, you know, Tip were six points down at one stage in the first half, Mike, and it was just real composure. Went down, scored one five then in, um, in, in a row. Like, but like you talk about Shamey there, right? Shame scored one one from play yesterday. And myself and Connor Cleary did a fair battle, but the amount of, of running and the amount of balls that broke off Shamey, and even if you look back in the game, there's two points he's directly involved in, right? Where he's actually falling to the ground, but he gives a yeah. hand pass just as he's fallen. Mm. And it's just it's just a frame of mind, like, like the experience to say, right, I, I might get this in my hand. If I do take it in my hand, I might overcarry it. I might get swarmed by the clear lads. And just the, the, the presence of mind just to flick it out. And, you know, we got we got two points directly from, from that off Shamey. You know, his goal, he'll say himself, he scored 37 championship goals now. It was probably it was probably one of the luckiest ones he got. And the thing for Aver Quilligan is if people watch it back, Aver Quilligan favours his uh, left hand at the top, so he's going he's gonna to want to go to his right. And that shot it actually goes to Aver Quilligan's left. And if you watch it, his wrist or his hands just aren't placed properly and the ball just sneaks in under his hurley. Aver Quilligan made two or three top drawer saves yeah, on yeah. this day, but he'll be very disappointed personally from, from that one. And, you know, as you said, they picked off the few points because they were able to find the space because they had, they, they had the, we, we, we actually freed up when I say we tip freed up party at the back. So mm. 
thought he, thought he had space while Aidan McCarthy has gone off. And what that allowed Tip to do was extra second on the ball to get a better quality ball in. And because of that, then we, we get, you know, we get one four away uh, aside, aside from Jo's penalty. But the experience of the boys was, the experience of the boys really, really stood through yesterday. Look, a lot of people are saying Noel came off there around maybe around the 50 minute mark. And for me, like maybe that that might be Noel now for for us. Like you know, it might be get the most out of Noel 50, 55 minutes to to second water break, and someone else comes on in an injection of energy because Noel just has that vision. You know, mm. he could be involved in so much for that time. And like you know, I just I thought it was a I, I, thought, I thought it was a, a really good performance in the second half yesterday by Tip because you know you could get caught up in all the madness too, Mike. You know, with yeah. everything that's going on and the bit of a crowd there yesterday was brilliant. You know, it was brilliant. Like you know, it did generate a bit of atmosphere, and I think you're going to see, Mike, as crowds get bigger as the years go on, as the year goes on. You, I think you'll see players making more mistakes because you know yeah. we all know what it's like when no one's watching you. You don't feel the pressure, but as the crowds get bigger, I think you might see more more of these little simple mistakes. Players running out over the ball, mis striking the ball because of the crowd, and I think I think that's brilliant as well. That's that's what we want to see in our games. Like. Absolutely, yeah. Um, from a Clare point of view, I think there's probably disappointment there that they didn't keep the heads and that they, even before that, there was a sense that they were kind of gone off. The, they played so well in the first half. Tip had weathered them, I would say, is probably a fair fair way to describe it, but Clare had done so well and, and, and it seemed to be a really even contest, but just whacking the ball in to the, to the target man, it just seems like... It, it seems like an old-fashioned way of doing things and it didn't... It, it, you know, they almost like suffered from being with the wind in the second half would you say yeah i think they did i think they maybe you know maybe came over reliant on aaron shanahan trying to win trying trying to win primary possession for them you know and I, as i said i thought Cahill did a really good job on tony kelly now tony mm. kelly pop, popped up at one nine he would have got one one from play now the goal he got um in fairness to Cahill, he had to commit for it and it was yeah. a lovely little freak by uh, ian galvin into him and super finished by tony kelly look you expect that the point the point tony kelly got was ridiculous like he was <laughs> Genie, he, he was nearly down a little taking the shot down the shot. Yeah. Just, that's, yeah. that's what he does. That's what you get from him. And you can't, you have to allow Tony Kelly four to five scores from open play in every game, minimum. And and Cahal Barrett kept him to two. And mm. I think I think I think that was that was a big part of Tip's foundation to build on for, for success there yesterday. Like and in fairness to the rest of the Clare forwards, while it didn't happen for Tony Kelly, like Ian Galvin pops up at one two inside the first quarter. Has to go off towards the end of the game, you know. Hold, I see him holding his leg. You know, David David Reedy was very lively. David Reedy was moving everywhere. He was he was looking for the ball and he was causing Paulie a bit of problems. And they just kind of nearly went away from that. Then in 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 the second half, you know, I suppose losing the guy, losing the man, and everything, and maybe their heads dropped and got a bit deflated. But they went away what what worked well for them in in the first half, Mike. If that if that makes sense. And to be honest, mm. like it was three three twenty three to two seventeen coming in there to the last ten minutes. And the last five scores in the game, Clare got them. So while Tip won by four points, I do feel Tip were, it was I do feel Tip that, were six, yeah. seven, eight points a better, a, be, a better team than they were yesterday. And uh, like uh, a lot of people might know this, but uh, Clare only had two wides in the last quarter, Mike. Right? And if people watch it back, and it wasn't really mentioned now last night, I don't know if it was mentioned by anyone. I was in the Mackey stand. I was at that side. Tony Kelly uh, had had a shot. And I tell you, it was 100% a hundred percent a point. It I knew four, I... it was four or five yards inside the post, and all the tip crowd were at that side of the Mackey stand, and we yeah. all just looked at each other. And all the you know the Sunday game crowd were up there as well, and we we're like, going, oh, sure, there's another point now, Tony Kelly. And your man waves it wide, and we we're like, if if tip only win this by a point, there's going to be war because. And I, I don't know why the yeah. wasn't brought up, but it was it was this much inside the post. You and could see so, that on TV. I yeah. completely forgot about it, and I knew I knew one that it just looked like a score, and then two was you know, and on TV sometimes you could be wrong on that way, but then and then the secondly, it was like you knew from the way Kelly ran in at the umpire that those lads are never wrong on that. Like you know what I mean? I was just, oh, they, and it was just brushed off. And it, again, it it kind of comes back to what we're saying is that everything was defined by that Aiden McCarthy decision. You know, like in, yeah. in the match, it was like there it was, was almost looking at yeah. the, the Aaron Shanahan. Was it a penalty? I see Tip Tipper fighting back, saying that Heffernan was fouled first. And there's a million things to talk about. But uh, Asher, look, it's um, it's, oh, it's uh, definitely yeah. it's definitely a point. But Mike, as you said, it was lost in the madness of everything else going mm. on, and um, because Aidan yeah. McCarthy, I think, was getting really getting ready to come back on at that stage and everything. But the whole tension of the crowd, clear crowd, they were furious at the match. They were booing. I think that they actually didn't even notice it because, as I said. You wouldn't really see it from the uncovered stand at the other side. It wasn't at that angle. But where we yeah. were, where I was sitting in the Mackey stand, it, it, it was a clear point. It was a clear yeah. point. And I don't know how there wasn't more made of it. But anyway, look, there wasn't. But uh, as I said, you know, you know, inches, like, you know, so they, 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 Mike Barry Heffernan and Aaron Shannon, 
it's six and one half a dozen in the other i think with that they were both they were both wrestling both testing the jerseys there when the ball came down i suppose the clare fans were feeling after they got hard done by by the decision otherwise usually the teams that get hard done by usually get those 50 50 calls <laughs> I thought that might uh, I'll be the case. All right, I, I'm a little bit less adamant about that than I was. I, I'll, I'll come back. I, I'll, I'll say maybe it was seven of one and five of the other rather than. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm a little bit more uh, magnanimous in that. Look, let's uh, come out of our own teams here for a few minutes and talk about sort of some of Saturday's games because, um, like Dublin beating Galway, you talk about maybe maybe uh, some fans creating some mistakes, like Dublin were brilliant, and but Galway, it has to be said, I, I, I don't think anyway we're at the races, some of it was that Dublin not letting them play, um, but other would, I'd be very worried if I was a Galway fan, but from Dublin's point of view, like, they just needed this so much, didn't they, for Maddie Kenny, for the development of the entire sport in the county, because, you know, you had the, you, the obviously the great Anthony Daly days, you had the big win over 20, in 2019, that I, was ruined in a way by what happened in the quarterfinal, the preliminary quarterfinal against Leach yeah. then, you know, and it was almost yeah. it was taken away that they'd not go away at the championship and then a disappointing year last year. And it just felt like it could be, we were thinking during the league this year, is it slipping away from Dublin? Are they going to fall back down to where they're competing with Leashes and Antrims? And it's anything but. We talked about, we predicted it a little bit last week that was like they looked a really good side against Antrim and they went out and proved it then. Oh, they did, and like, jeez, I made the worst call, I'd say, I've made in a long time. I thought Antrim actually actually beat them, and they just came and blew them away. And then even on, at the weekend, I thought, you know, Galway, with the team they have, and the panel mm. they have, and the way they were going in the league, and the set of forwards they have, I thought, you know, this is this is going to be Galway and the Leinster final, guaranteed, you know, number two team in the country to Limerick at the moment. Terrible call again. I'd say, actually, the only good call I made Saturday was to was to my mother to tell her I got the vaccine, and everything was okay <laughs> after it, you know that? So, like... Uh, Oh, stop. But, like, I tell you about, we, we, as we, we were talking about over the weekend, Mike, the, the art of defending was very, very clear to see with the Dublin lads there at the weekend. 118 to 114. They keep Galway now. Galway with forwards like, you know, Joe Canning, Cooney, Brian Con Cannon, uh, Evan Nyland yeah. coming on, you know, um, Connor Whelan. They kept them to 1 8 from play for the whole match. That is mm. phenomenal going. Like, and yeah. Galway scored 114 altogether. And, you know, I'd be looking at the likes of, you know, Owen O'Donnell, he's just a massive player. He's, it's probably the only blip on the weekend for the Dublin lads is that he has a hamstring injury. Hopefully, hopefully he'll get back for them. But like, I mean, like Keno, Keno Callahan, the job he does, rocking that mullet like inside the helmet. You know, Paddy Smith, they're, 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 they're not going to be nine or, ten, nine or ten out of ten players, but they do their job really, really well. And they do their job for the team. Rush at centre-back looking good yeah. there. Danny Sutcliffe in all-star form that he had from 2013. You know, Dara Gray popping up with two points, like, you know, so, I mean, and Chris Crummy, who we all maybe thought was a back, but the touch he made for the goal, I mean, sure, any any top four, TJ Reid or anyone would be happy with the touch he made to kill the ball and put it in the net. But the art of defending was very, very clear to see. If you think about it, right, if I said to you before the match, Mike, Brian Concannon won't score from play, Joseph Cooney won't score from play, Adrian Tui won't score from play, all right? They, Galway have 14 wides. And I, yeah. and I do think a lot of this was to do with his injury. Joe Joe had six of those wides on his own. Joe actually had nine shots for his scores mm. um, at, the, at the weekend. And I just feel, he's, I don't think his tongue is fully right. And I think maybe he has a, a slight uh, rib injury as well. So I think that's very clear to see that any day that Joe Canning has six wides, he's just not fully right and he's not at the races. And to see Evan Nyland coming on, taking over the freeze was, was another indicator for me. But... I just thought that, you know, the first Leicester final for Dublin 2014, they just brought a workman-like performance, a team performance. It was phenomenal to see, you know, I think Donald Burke, while he only scored two points from play, his, his wrist work around there, he takes mind, and not the most physical guy, but his mm. wrist work and the ball he can give in. As I said, Dara Gray, I mean, I thought Alan Nolan was, was in line for man of the match as well. I know Conor Burke covered the world around, and he does that job brilliantly, sitting deep for Dublin. I thought Alan Nolan, the saves, he made three or four top drawer saves, chipped in with a pint, but his puck outs as well, his vision for the puck outs yeah. is excellent. So yeah. it's a great, great performance all over the field. And, and Mike, on, on the back of a very, very hard week for Dublin personally, with James Madden, you know, turning, like going out to play for his county, you know, burying his dad Noel there. And he was like to hear his, hear the interview saying that that's what his dad would have wanted. And, and for Matty Kenny as well, I believe had to bury his brother-in-law yesterday. So you imagine the emotion that was there beforehand but to channel that emotion, that energy that, you know, Owen Kelly used to always say to us that if you're nervous, it's good because nerves gives you energy. And sometimes emotion can go one or two ways for you. And I think the Dublin lads channel that emotion in into like 
let's just go out and give the best performance we can for everybody like you know mm. and i think they really really did that and i'm sure everybody everybody associated with that dublin team and panel and their family were just so proud of them at the weekend by the way they performed and into to beat galway in the manner they did four points they never ever fell behind once in the game as well which i yeah. thought was a sign of a team that's really dominated the game so i think you can only you know dublin are going into Leinster final now against kilkenny and you would be afraid to tip against them now at this stage you know because i'd say the belief in the group is just unbelievable there after the weekend Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you mentioned Adam Nolan there. We're, we're I'll talk about it a little bit later in the show with Morris, but we have, I think, the rolling all-stars that we do every year. We're launched it tomorrow where we try and pick the team as the as the year goes on. And I'm absolutely perplexed for goalkeeper because you've got Adam Nolan. And this is only for a starting point, never mind at the yeah. end of the year. But you've got Adam yeah. Nolan, you've got, like, Nicky Quaid. Like, that was just such a brilliant save, I thought. Like, you know, and there's so much more to goalkeeping than saving, but some of the saves on display this week were absolutely fantastic. Like Owen Murphy as well, obviously he got the sim bidding, but he, he, he in general, just like always the best keeper out there. It seems to me, you know, like saves all around really like in, in, in nearly every game, I think every keeper had some good saves, but it's uh Nolan for me definitely is, is someone that like he, the way he contributes almost in open play as well can be fantastic mm -hmm. for Dublin, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. He's, he's, He's got a sweet strike of a ball, you know, that was evident from the point he got, but he's puck out as well. But, you know, I'd say your role in All-Stars now could be as controversial as that Sinbin decision as the year goes on. You know, I'm sure there's always good crack there and people writing in who, who they'd have. And who We're never have right anyway, Shane, that's for no, sure. No, 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 no. <laughs> right. yeah. But you're, look, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day, Mike, anyway. So, look, you have to be right sometimes, you know. <laughs> Uh, qu quickly on Galway, right? Uh, uh, Morris, who was talking to in a few minutes, Galway man, I was texting Jordan uh, over the weekend, and he was like, his big worry for Galway is that they have a lot of great athletes in the team, but in a match like that, where uh, Dublin kind of like crowd you out, you kind of realise that they don't really have any runners, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and that would be a, a worry for them. And then I think as well, like, you know, is there any question over Shane O'Neill if that, if Joe isn't right, and you have to play Joe Canning. I understand that he's there for his presence alone. But say if say if his thumb isn't right and his accuracy isn't right, should he be taken off freeze, for example, much earlier? Is that like a thing of like, is this his? Is this Shane O'Neill's team or is it Joe Canning's team? I and look, you know Joe a lot better than I do. I know Mel. I don't think he's an ego man or anything like that. I wouldn't say it, but it's um, it still does take a manager to come in and say, here, pull you pull pull it out of this a little bit. It's not your day, you know. Yeah, no, I agree, yeah. And I mean, look, a lot of people might realise Joe Canning made his debut in 2008, like, you know, I mean, that's 14 seasons ago, like 13 yeah. years or 14 seasons ago, and he had a lot of hurling done by the time he was 16, 17. Like, he was winning county finals for Portumna when he was 15, 16 years of age, so he has a lot he has a lot done for him, like, you know. But I, I, I do agree with you, Mike, yeah, I just feel, and I and I feel it was there in the Cork match a bit as well the other day, you know, that it just wasn't happening for Hoggy, like, you know, and I'm a, I'm a massive fan of Pat Horgan, and I think, you know, if you're on about building statues to people and all this, the Cork people should think about building one to him because I think he has been maybe when they haven't had great teams since he's he's got involved, he papers over the cracks a small bit with his individual performances. But it just he wasn't at the races the other day, and maybe like you know, there's no one player bigger than the team, and I suppose that's up to the manager to decide that. But yeah, look, I mean, if you have a free taker like Evan Island on the bench, and it's just not happening for Joe, and I I don't think Joe was fully right now with with, with the injuries and everything. You know, I think you have to you have to look at it and say, look. It's it's the team wins, everyone wins. It's 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 not about anyone. And Joe Kenning would be the first to say, if you want to put Evan Island in the freeze, absolutely. And I'm sure Pat Horgan would be the same because he's all about the team. And you said it there, Mike. He's not about ego at all. Jeez, if anyone could be about ego, it could be Joe. Like, but he's absolutely not. He's a top man. I lived with him in college in LIT. Lovely guy, down to earth, and and he's all about Galway winning first and foremost. So if I I'd say that. You know, if that if that decision had to be made, he'd be he'd have absolutely no no, no problem with it. But as you said, it's, it's it's a big call to make, isn't it? Like you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, look at Galway. If, if there's one team that could come back through, even the, despite the insane run, you would probably fancy Galway to do it. But not on the performance at the weekend. But taking nothing away from Dublin. The other game then is like madcap lunatic game. I saw there's a thing like the NFL do. Uh, there's an NFL guy on on Twitter called Scorag Scoragami, I think, where it's like every time there's a result that's never happened before. He kind of, you know, he, he puts it up. I, I don't think there's such a service in hurling, but I'd imagine two thirty-seven to two twenty-nine has never happened in a, in, a, yeah, in a hurling championship match before. But even after extra time, but uh, like for me, Kilken there's two things in this game. Was one is like 
how they keep kind of developing lads like on Cody or how Bally Hale do it, where they might like this guy looks like he's another TJ, another Henry, you know, and it's it's just unbelievable. Like, but the other thing is like mm-hmm. Kilkenny, their ability to just go on runs in that game. Wexford kept getting three, four points ahead, and then Kilkenny would five minutes later be two up again, and they just do yeah. it through it was just grabbing the game a little bit for 10 minute periods or five minute periods and that was and obviously they did it eventually in the second half of extra time and there was no coming back from it then and that's why they won it like but they're you, I, you always uh, sorry I, I i'm rambling here a bit but the, the assumption is sometimes with kenny that that's experience but if you look around the team it's not that experienced anymore like killian buckley was on the bench fogarty was on the bench wally walsh was on the bench this is a young team but mm. brian cody and it's 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 almost inbuilt in them at this stage from from birth, really, isn't it? If, like it, it's just as I said, it like no matter what Kilkenny team takes the field, and no matter what fifteen lads pull on that black and amber jersey, you will find it hard to beat them, as you said, because their whole lives they're told you have to work hard, you have to win your own ball, and they just have that culture of just never giving in and never saying dying. And that's why they've won the most All-Ireland hurling titles of all time. Like, I mean, they, they just never, ever know their bet, like, and they'll never, ever give in. And, and as you said, three, four points down against Wexford at several times in the match. And even in the first half, they were twice, they were three points down. They scored the next four points. They went three points down. They scored the next four points to take them in at half time, a point yeah. up. But like, they had five goal chances in the first half, Mike. And right, and and Owen Cody supposed to had one of them scored, finished up the game one five play, hit the post one of them. But like I'm saying, goal chances is in. Massey Cohan had a chance, you know, give a ball off, and um, no, they you know they did fi- actually five clear goal chances where yeah. if they taken the right choice, they could have gone in, they could have been in 12, 13 points up, handy enough. But at the same time, to go in a point up after being three points down twice in the first half of Ireland because they never give in. To go back to the scoring thing for a second, Mike. Like the average before yesterday was three go- or before the weekend, three goals, forty-six points a game, and they, we had five goals. And the old Mats now will kick in here, sixty-six points, five goals, sixty-six points in uh, in Kilkenny Wexford. But I have to mention, like the the Valley Hill contingent, you mentioned it there, right? TJ chips in with sixteen points. Co- Owen Cody one five from play. Richie Reed two points from play, and Mullen a point from play. So our two thirty-seven, the small little place in Valley Hill contributes one twenty-four. Like, there's some going for, for, for one club, isn't it? Like, you know, and as you said, they yeah. just keep rolling them out. Oh, Cody's uncle wasn't a bad hurler now either. Now, a lot of people might notice he's a lad called Henry Shefflin. So, uh, you know, he's from good stock there. And they say that uh, an ounce of breeding is better than a ton of feeding, I think, is another saying they use. But I thought that Kilkenny's bench was awesome there yesterday as well, Mike. Um, from seven subs they brought on, they scored 1-9. And I suppose in comparison to that, Wexford scored 1-1. One, one. And you know, Mike, Wexford's game is running in its energy. And I yeah. just feel that the life got sucked out of them. And the lads that came on for them didn't contribute as much as the Kilkenny lads that came on. It's 1-9 one, versus 1-1 one, one from your bench. And, you know, they, 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 they win the match then by eight points. But, like, mm-hmm. the other thing for me was uh, Owen Murphy's influence in the game. Absolutely massive. And he tweeted about love and hawker you know and kenny lads love hawker you know i think ever since 2014 since bubbles point didn't go over but uh, like he, he he tweeted saying no love hawker and you, you love to see that human side of him as well i know one murphy from lads went to college and he's great crack love yeah. the crack and it's nice to see the human side of him but the save he makes and i think the game is 135 maybe to 229 and mm. billy ryan goes up and gets a point and that's a four point turnaround from rory o'connor nearly getting a goal to going up the field, getting the point. Wally Walsh gets the goal in in the 86 minutes. Sure, you know that's it. It's game. It's game over. Yeah, then after that, yeah. but I just thought their bench was was unbelievable there yesterday. And you know, I'll talk about Hawkeye. Like, if Hawkeye isn't there, Mike, does Liam yeah. Ryan's does Liam Ryan's point not be given as a point? Is Connor McDonald's goal stands and Wexford win the game mm. by two points? It's all leaves and buts. But you know what? Such an exciting game of hurling. And as we said, five goals and sixty-six points, unbelievable stuff. Like it was it was great to see over the weekend that 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 exciting hurling and the period remember that period of play I think was highlighted for was yeah. it a minute and a half. That was unbelievable. Unbelievable yeah. stuff. Brilliant to see it. Like hope we see lots more of it now over the next few weeks. Yeah, some drama. There was a moment actually it's funny, after after Walsh's goal that kind of won the game for Kilkenny, uh 
Kilkenny got a point straight after, and there was a there was a roar from the crowd, and, and it's so quiet because it was only eight thousand people. But I was thinking to myself, it's like no matter how many years they had to do the buttons for the fake noise, they'd never be able to get the specific crowd noises of matches that you go to. That mm. that was a crowd of. Jesus, we got out of jail there. We're going to win this game. And now we're running it up a little bit. And it's almost there's four layers to what that exact sound was. And I heard it. And I was like, Jesus, great to have crowds back at matches, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, if you think about it, only, only, only 2,000 from each county as well. You know what yeah, I mean? exactly, imagine, yeah. imagine if it 8,000. I heard, I heard rumors that maybe the Munster final might go to 10,000, Mike. Oh, wow. That would be unbelievable. That'd be brilliant. Please, God, you know. So imagine if you had another five or 6,000 likes for people there roaring at the end of that match. Because exactly. I remember the Munster crowd in 2019. They were loud, so they were. <laughs> Great fans. Well, the Munster final that might have 10,000 will be Tip and Limerick again. Uh, you know, I thought that there was, it was a, a point, I was thinking last night when I was watching the interviews on, on um, uh, from, from Kingston and from Kylie that it shows how far Limerick have come that they win a Munster semi final against Cork by eight points. And Cork are talking about how they were pleased with how they played. And Limerick are, you know, they're a little bit disappointed, I thought. And it's just like, Jesus okay. Christ! In the last five years, Limerick Hurling have—I don't think—have they ever beaten Cork by eight points in a semi-final and not been absolutely ecstatic about it? Do you know what I mean? In their history, it yeah. shows how far they've come, doesn't it? It shows how far they've come. But I think just to touch on the Cork thing for a second, right? Cork lost against Waterford last year in the Munster Championship, and it was the most lifeless, um, energyless, um, like like passion. There was no passion there from the Cork lads, and the way they lost, the way they lost on Saturday. The performance was much better and still lost by eight points. Like they're a young team. I think they have 10 lads around yeah. the un, 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 under the age of 24, the Cork lads. But it's the way like they actually they actually outscored um, Limerick on the hooks and blocks. So they 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 work savagely hard. And I thought at the back, like Sean O'Donoghue was it was immense. Kip kept Aaron Galan scoreless from play. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like and um we talk about Sean Finn the other side as well, like two of them, two top class cornerbacks. Um but Cork worked really hard. The, the killing thing for him wasn't was was Mike was this. They never closed that gap to a goal, and they had yeah. loads of chances to do it. And you know, even in the final quarter, they just weren't clinical enough. They had five wides. You know, Owen Cadigan's one probably stands out where he's all on his own. That would have brought it back to three. And then you're thinking, if they get a goal, if they get a goal. But I suppose Pat Horgan's influence, we just didn't see it. No score from play, and didn't score at all in the final quarter. And mm. you know, it was it was a killer for them. Whereas. You know, Darius Gibbon was very good three points from play. Jack O'Connor, I thought, was really good three points from play. Shane Barrett, really good, and he came on two points from play. Jer Millerick worked ferociously hard for the team as well. And as we said, as I mentioned, Sean O'Donoghue at the back. So there was lots of positives to take from. But here we are talking about Cork and how good they were. Yeah. Emery weren't even that good, right? If I said to you before the match, Aaron Galan won't score from play. Tom Morrissey won't score from play. All right? Mm-hmm. Garrod Hegarty won't have one of his best days, gets taken off. And they still win the match by eight points. But, like, I mean, it's the sign of a true championship team, like, isn't it? Like that. Yeah. When Peter Casey gets the Sydney it's 1 5 to 6 points. And Limerick outscore. Limerick did to Cork what Tip did to Clare, but they were minus the man. They mm-hmm. outscored them 2 4 to 2 points. And I yeah. just think it's a sign of the team. They're getting the guys on the ball that they want to get in the ball. Like Keen Lynch, Garrod Hegarty, these guys are getting top possessions in the game. And it's no fluke because Limerick want them on the ball. Whereas, for Cork, you know, the, the, the Sean O'Donoghue was one of the top positions. And when your cornerback is one of the top positions, it's probably not a good sign for the rest of the team. But Limerick know exactly who they want on the ball, and they know exactly who they want on the ball for the opposition as well. But it was, to, to get that 2-4 while while Peter Casey was gone, yeah, um, it was a killer. And a very, very unlucky goal. Sean O'Donoghue, the deflection, he did everything right, but the deflection of Darrell Donovan. Kyle Hayes' run not being tracked from wing back. The ball was bombed down from a puck out. He runs on. Takes a chance, isn't tracked. Lovely pass by Galan, and that to cut in off his right and finish it. Like people forget, like that Limerick have three top class forwards in their backs. Kyle Hayes, man of the match, all in the final centre forward. Declan Hannon played a lot of his career in the forwards. <laughs> Barry Nash getting man of the match underage for Limerick in the forwards. So they have guys who are comfortable on the ball and know the type of ball that the forwards want as well. And that was evident from Kyle Hayes yesterday. A lot, not a lot of wing backs would be up there comfortable to cut in off their right. They'd be happy to take the point. I'd be happy to take the point as a midfielder, Mike. But he caught in, buried it below. And uh, I just thought, I think Limerick lads, are, I think it's worrying for the rest of us that they won a Munster semi-final by eight points and they didn't play that well. <laughs> like it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's And that's me. it. That's it. Because there's a, there's like Tip will look at the league and this game and see opportunities, you know. And that's the question then is Limerick have a lot of improvement to do, but even 
when not at their best. They're at that level now of a hurling team who can, we're talking about Kilkenny, we talk about Dublin football or whatever, who can win matches, you know, and that's match play is as big a deal as um, as performance level and skill levels and everything like that, you know. So, you know, but Tip Bar, again, the most experienced team they're going to come up against this year. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, there will be. Look, and I tell you, look, Mike, I'm where I'm living here, Ballina Hinch, uh, we're actually very close to Newport. And Newport is basically a suburb now of Limerick. You know, half the people living in Newport are, would actually be Limerick people, you know. And, and even in the school below, I know we have County Colours Day there in the school. You know, be three or four kids in my class have Limerick jerseys on. So there's, there, there is a fierce rivalry where, where we are here, you know, with those in the Limerick lads. But, it's, you know, it's, it's a good, healthy rivalry. But Limerick have had our number now for some time. Like they gave us a fair bait down Park Creve last year in the last Munster final play in 2019. Yeah, they gave us by 12 points, I think it was. So Liam Sheep will be getting these boys ready to go to war, absolute war against Limerick, and in, in the Munster final in two weeks. And I'm sure John Kiley will be the exact same. You know, there's 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 never any question of passion or when it comes to Tiff and Limerick matches. And you know, the Munster Cup now is called the Mick Mackey Cup, and you know, I'm like, what another added incentive for Limerick? You know, with the hand boys involved in Mick Mackey and everything he did for Limerick Hurling and for a hand for them to bring back the Mick Mackey Cup for the first time it's been called mm. the Mick Mackey Cup, I, I I I do believe. So, you know, it's 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 just so many things. Just just quickly, John, I know I know or sorry, Mike, we're 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 flat out talking. The trust that John Kiley has in his players is unbelievable. He had five lads in yellow cards, right? And I just I was listening to him talking afterwards and he said in the second half, one of the key things we had five guys in yellow cards going into it, but we trusted those guys and we didn't take them off. We trust them in their tackling, and we didn't pick up another yellow in the second half, which was really a telling factor. Like he's massive trust in them guys. Like Dermot Burns is on a yellow, and in 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 the half back position, you can easily get another one, and you'll be gone then. But I tell you, like in 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 the second half, I think Limerick only gave away it was something like six or seven frees, and yeah. that was the trust, and that's the culture they have there, and they're a serious group. Their bench came on and made a difference again. And as I said, win a monster final by win a monster semi final by eight points, not playing well. It's 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 worrying for the rest of us, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Before we go, uh, Limerick for Liam once. So I don't know who he is or uh, who he supports, but uh, he <laughs> felt the Limerick, uh, the Peter Casey Simba was harsh. What do you think of the decision? I just uh, like there is an element though of like the Fife's one for Waterford. This one probably the wrong decision but one of those understandable wrong decisions where the ref didn't like if he gives the free he has to give the yellow card almost you know whereas it's yeah. very different than the Ed McCarthy one yeah that's it it was inside the D I suppose it's careless use of the hurley as well wasn't he came in over the top with the hurley and yeah. um, you know I suppose people are saying was it a clear goal scoring chance which is this look we could be here all day talking about <laughs> it Mike. it is as, as I said I think I think what Fergal Horgan said early in the year is it is really a matter of opinion and it is down to the ref but I think what people would like to see is, right, if the ref's not sure, if he makes the decision, fine. But maybe have a chat with the other eight officials around. I'm talking about fourth officials, umpires either end, you know, linesmen, whoever can see it, whoever might have seen it, um, seen a clear view of it. it. It is down to a matter of opinion of the refs. The refs will have talk about this in depth. Uh, I suppose to answer the question, do I think the, the, the sin bin was harsh? I, I don't think it was harsh because I think that it was a matter of opinion of the ref and the ref felt that he was inside the D, it was careless use of the hurley. So going by the rule book and the matter of that particular ref, I, I think it, it was it was a sin bin by letter of law. But great save by Nicky Quaid. But I suppose like Ava Quilligan, it going the wrong side of him for Shamey. Pat Horgan did put it to the to the right side of Nicky Quaid. Mm. Which is, who's who? Who am I to tell Pat Horgan to take penalties? I, I barely scored one out in the back garden here. <laughs> <laughs> Shane, listen, I, we've got a, we've got much longer than uh, producers shouting in my ear uh, here, but at the same time, I don't think a weekend like that uh, could afford a minute less than it. But uh, thanks a million for uh, brilliant analysis all the way through. So uh, we'll we'll give you the week off. We'll talk a bit of football next week, and we'll we'll catch up with you for the finals in a couple of weeks. Great, great stuff. Thanks, Mike. All the best. Thanks a million, Shane. Uh, don't forget, if you enjoyed that chat, please do subscribe to the channel. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast. Um, if you're listening to the show uh, back, so uh, please do hit the subscribe button and we'll be here with you every Monday with uh, Shane. Unbelievable analysis there from Shane. And of course, uh, with Darren O'Sullivan when we're talking football, he'll be back with us next week. 